Ford Jr. <laughs> you know you want to be like Ford. <laughs> yeah. uh, good morning, everybody. I'm thinking, I'm thinking about last Sunday. I, I came in to do my, my offertory prayer, come up here, and it was Colossians 15, I think, was, and it was... Uh, I did it, and I looked on the boulevard on our bulletin, and Pam had the exact same word. I don't think she knew it was a Bible verse, and I didn't know it was a song, but I think we're on the same page, okay? Yeah. Well, we were till this morning now, but you can sing it. Might be I need to sing today. Sing it, sing it. Yeah. But uh, I have a, another Bible verse this morning. Just uh, want to share it with you. We find it to Okay, here we go. Oh, it's from Galatians 9 and 10. Let us not be weary in doing good, for at the proper time we shall reap a harvest. If we do not give up, therefore we have opportunity let us do good to all people, especially in those who belong to the family of believers. Let's go to the Lord and ask him to bless our tithes this morning. His words out. Holy Father, we thank you so much that we, we can gather together in freedom and praise, your, praise you and sing songs in your name, Lord. we just so thankful for all that you do for us, our, our homes, our health, Lord. We, Ask for your guidance and direction, everything that we say and do, Lord. We thank you for your grace when we fail. I want to lift Brother Robert up to you this morning. Just uh, use him to show us how to how to get to heaven, show us the light and the truth. Uh, we thank you for him and what he does for us, Lord. We want to lift our ties up. Just use them to further your kingdom. It's a symbol of our love and our obligation to you, Lord. We, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he meant. He has done to us on the miracle on the cross. It's his name that we pray, Lord. Amen. <laughs> Even when I cannot see 
Well, because this broken road is your will for me. Well, I'm broken. I still see your face. Well, I've spoken, pouring your words of grace. Well, I will walk by faith, even when I cannot see. Well, because this broken road, there's your will for me. There you are. Hi, uh. Wow, oh, I was just listening to a little music. And actually, the one chord that I was going to let you listen to what I was listening to. Those who can't hear the music think the dancer's mad. I was listening to the Linus and Lucy theme from, uh, from Peanuts. And I was going to do that on Jimmy's phone and our wonderful Wi-Fi signal here that doesn't work. Uh, and I had to make a last minute adjustment in my cord that would let you hear the music because I brought the speaker. Anyway, uh, let's, yeah, there we go. Uh, we're all dancing to something. What are you dancing to? Matthew chapter 11. I invite you to turn there. I enjoyed that. I've also wanted to be Pentecostal holiness and that's my one dip of the toe into that but i might be talking to the assembly of god next week i never know <laughs> matthew chapter 11 the words of jesus pray with me and for me <laughs> father help us hear you this morning help us to let you Examine our hearts. You know what we're dancing to. You know the rhythms we are caught up in. And I pray you would reveal them to us if we don't know them. And then show us the rhythm where you want us to walk. Get me out of your way. In your name I pray. Amen. Matthew 11. The end of the chapter. Verse 28. Jesus offers one of the most wonderful invitations. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy 
and my burden is light. Eugene Peterson's The Message paraphrase has been out for over 20 years and probably the most quoted verse of Peterson's The Message is his paraphrase of Matthew 11:28 through 30. I love it. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. My favorite phrase in that, the unforced rhythms of grace. We often see our lives in a linear motion. On my mother's tombstone there up in uh, near Bessemer, it reads September 26, 1926, dash August 4th, 1996. We've heard this before. Life is what takes place in the dash. And we often see the rhythm of our life as being, or the, the, we often see our lives as being linear, but not always the rhythms of it. The gentle sway, sunrise, noon, sundown, midnight, our circadian rhythms of sleep, which we probably all have had interrupted last night with the time change. Spring equinox, summer solstice, autumn equinox, winter solstice. The days are getting shorter, the nights are getting longer. High tide and low tide. I love to be at the beach. I, I love to read a tide chart. So I know, is it high tide, low tide? Sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Birds in flight, a flock of geese or ducks in a V formation. A murmuration of starlings. You begin to see those this time of year. The breaching of migrating whales. The Sundays of Advent, hope, love, joy, peace. The 40 days of Lent between Ash Wednesday and Good Friday and then resurrection. Those are the sacred rhythms, not the artificial ones. Life is never static. We live in a, a symphony. We are in a living symphony. We are in a, in a never ending story. We are living in a moment of history that has never been nor will ever be again. We're caught up in a dance. A dance beneath our feet and a dance over our heads. A dance before the world and a dance before our creator. There are some questions for us this morning. What are you dancing to? What is your rhythm? What is the cadence of your life? I've been in a noticing season lately. I've noticed a lot of things these past few months, little subtle things, some of which are actually huge. When you notice something you've never noticed before or perhaps have overlooked or forgotten, it adds an extra layer of meaning. It adds insight. For example, Psalm 23. We all know Psalm 23, probably the most famous psalm in the, in the Psalter. I was reading back in September early on using the little one minute pause app and whatever paraphrase, whatever translation was used at the moment, Psalm 23, 3 reads this way. It says, he guides me in the right paths. The Holy Spirit caused the plurality of that word path to jump out of the page at me. He guides me in the right paths. I was reading from a modern translation, so I grabbed my King James and thought, is that the way it says it there? And sure enough, there it is. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Sometimes some truths in scripture loom so large, they cast a shadow over all other scripture. And I believe John 14, six is a verse like that, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, indicating there's only one way to God. And then when Jesus said, broad is the gate, but narrow the road that leads to salvation. And those are true. Yes, there is only one way to God, but there are, according to Scripture, there are many ways, many paths to follow Jesus, as unique as you are. 
back when I was Sequoia a little over a month ago, I went to the Giant Forest. The Giant Forest is the hub of Sequoia National Park. It's almost 40 miles of maintained trails within three square feet, or excuse me, square, square miles of forest. That's, that's uh, pretty incredible. You could spend a whole week there. It's just a labyrinth of, I'm reading this upside down. Yeah. It's just a labyrinth of trails here. You could spend a whole week exploring all these trails and they would take you to different vistas and to see different things and observe things. And the amazing thing about it is most people enter the giant forest, they go right to the General Sherman tree and they all crowd around it and then they hike back out. And they don't see any of the rest of this. So you could actually be in this huge space with a lot of other people in the park, but you don't see any of them. The giant forest is a labyrinth of trails crisscrossing, intersecting one another. That's a, it's a fraction, that is a fraction, rather, of an image of the many paths of righteousness that we could be led on. Because the kingdom of God that is already here on earth is much larger than three square miles. If you are a believer, if the king lives in residence in your heart, then everywhere you set your foot is the kingdom. Paths of righteousness. Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. And he knows the spiritual muscles within you which have atrophied because of misuse or neglect. Jesus knows exactly the unique disciple of his he has created you to be. He knows the specific path of righteousness that he is calling you to get on today because until you start walking that path with him you're not following him as completely as you imagine you are he guides us in the right paths the particular path you need the prescriptive path he chooses so that's one thing i've noticed matthew or excuse me psalm 23 3 Another verse that's jumped out to me of late. John chapter 10, verses 3 through 4. Verse 3, Jesus said, The sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Verse 4, When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. And here's what's jumped out and quickened my spirit here. It says he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He calls you by name. Leads you out of the fold. I think because it is mentioned here that his sheep know his voice, not once but twice, that makes us stop and think, do I know his voice? Do I know what he sounds like? I mean, I, I hear believers occasionally say, I've never heard God speak to me. Well, that would raise some questions. First question, I would think, are you his sheep? That's a legitimate question. If I don't know God's voice, never heard God speak, are you a sheep? Mm -hmm. or you, you, once you get that nailed down, yeah, I, I'm his sheep, then you need to, okay, why are you missing his voice? But I think the leaning for most of us is the fact that his sheep know his voice. And that overshadows the other equally powerful statement. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So as he guides us in the right paths, John 3 reiterates the fact that Jesus is calling us to a very personal path. Has your name on it. Psalm 23, he guides us in the right path. John 10, he calls you out by name, which leads to some questions. What's your rhythm? What's your path? What journey is your heart and your soul on right now, November 6, 2022? What is God teaching you lately? If I were to ask that question over lunch, how would you respond? Where is Jesus trying to lead you in your life right now? How and where are you attempting to follow him right now? Perhaps you are currently using a rhythm you have learned or heard about here in worship the last few years since 2020. Maybe that's ringing a bell. 
It's time for a state of the church test. And yes, this is one of those tests. Usually I ask questions that I say, don't raise your hand. This morning, no, I want you to raise your hand. Not so that you can walk out of here feeling like a Pharisee or a Republican. That's not the point. Just kind of test time. Okay, you knew it was coming. You should have. <laughs> Here's a path. 30 days to resilient. The one minute pause app. 30 days. I've been talking about this since June. Those 30 morning devotionals, 30 evening devotionals, lasting anywhere from 6 to 12 minutes apiece. You can download the app upon your phone. Question, how many of us have listened to at least one of the 30 days to resilient devotionals on the One Minute Pause app? Raise your hand. It's good to see you. Okay, how many of us have listened to several of the 30 days to resilient devotionals on the one minute pause app? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of us have gone through all 30 days of the 30 days to resilient morning and evening devotionals on the one minute pause app? Raise your hand. I notice a drop off in the hands there. How many of us have downloaded the app, but we've never used it? Anybody? Okay. How about prayer circles? Let's leave the app behind. Let's go to prayer circles. Remember? Remember this? Y'all got one. If you were here two years ago. Remember? Take the chalk, draw a circle. How many of us took the chalk home and drew a circle on the floor somewhere in our house and got inside the circle and prayed? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of us prayed inside our circle for at least a week? Raise your hand. How many of us prayed inside our circle for at least a month? Raise your hand. Again, the hands are dropping. <laughs> How many of us used the draw the circle devotional guide? 40 days of prayer where you're inside the circle. I referenced this. I, I think I had it here to show you. Anybody use this? Anybody? Raise your hand. If you did draw the circle, when did you stop using it? If you didn't draw the circle, why didn't you start? You were given a rhythm. You were coached in a rhythm. You were coached in a rhythm to use the app. How, how many of us remember what evangelist Gypsy Smith said we should pray when we get inside the circle? Anybody remember that? Go home, draw a circle around yourself. They asked Gypsy Smith, how is it that God works in revivals everywhere you go? And he said, I, go home, here's, how, here's what you do. Go home, take a piece of chalk, draw a circle around, your, around on your floor. Get in the circle and pray for God to bring revival in the circle. <laughs> Gypsy Smith did it. He prayed it fervently. We want revival what are we willing to do? That's, that's another rhythm, okay? Here's a third one. Didn't know there would be three, did you? How about the Beatitudes? How many of us are still using the Beatitudes as a guide for our spiritual rhythm? Raise your hand. How many of us reflect through the Beatitudes at least once a week? Raise your hand. How many of us reflect the, Be the Beatitudes at least once a month? Raise your hand. How many of us remember that not once but twice we went through the Beatitudes here in worship? Okay. And Jesus gave those eight Beatitudes to us as a spiritual rhythm of how we should follow him. That's how he started the Sermon on the Mount. I'm really interested to see where the third season of The Chosen goes because it will begin with the Sermon on the Mount. Those eight exclamations of Jesus are huge. They're the rhythm that we're called to walk through. I mean, there's eight components of it. Remember, anybody remember what, those, what we called all of that? What it meant to do what? To simply live. The unforced rhythm of grace to simply live. Anybody remember what each beatitude meant? 
I mean, one of them we should be able to figure out, you know, when Jesus said, oh, the bliss of the merciful. Oh, live mercifully. Yeah, boom, it's right there, it's there. Hmm. Again, this is not linear. This is not checking through a series of activities to make sure we do it like we used to do in the old offering envelopes. You know, read my Bible, came to Sunday school, staying for worship, you know. No, it's, it's rhythmic. There are three possible daily rhythms we have explored in this fellowship since 2020. Let's change. Maybe you're using another rhythm. What about your own personal rhythms? Perhaps you have a fourth and a fifth and a sixth rhythm that you're personally walking in through your prayer journal, through your time alone with Jesus right now. He guides us in the paths of righteousness. He calls us out by name, and the possibilities are endless. They're like the, the map. I don't know what I did with it. The map at the giant forest. I mean, whoa, come to this intersection. Where do I go? Can I go here? Go here. It's endless. Just last week, during quiet time, I had a strong conviction to return to a season of praying for my children and my grandchildren. The rhythm was already in my prayer journal where daily I pray something, I have something written in that I pray specifically for them. Like one day I, I pray that they would conform to the image of Jesus, I'm praying for the grandchildren to do that. You know, three-year-old, that's hard, you know. It's gonna take a while, it's taken me a while. I'm st he's still working on me. I mean, come on, I'm not there yet, but I'm praying for them. It just, the Holy Spirit just convicted me. You need to focus on, you need to drill down on this. And I'm like, yes, sir. That's a personal rhythm. Perhaps you're studying through a particular book of the Bible right now. Perhaps you're involved in a small group, ladies' small group, men's small group somewhere, et cetera, et cetera. The possibilities are limitless. There's just one or two, and I hesitate to use the word rhythm here. There's one or two ways I would strongly caution us to avoid. Number one is this. Your only rhythm is Sunday morning. Sunday morning worship, or Wednesday night dinner. That's your only rhythm. Now, true, part of that is being obedient to one of the Ten Commandments, which set aside the day, the Lord's day to worship. But tell me, how many of us could get by an entire week by eating just one physical meal? That's one possibility. Sunday, Wednesday. There's another possibility. You don't have a rhythm. Because Sunday is not in your routine normally, nor is Wednesday. If we don't have a rhythm, you know what that's called? That's called inertia. <laughs> if you don't have a rhythm, that's called a rut. And I heard a long time ago a preacher say, a rut is just a grave with both ends knocked out. That's what a rut is. If I looked in your time alone with God, if I just popped up, your time alone with the Lord one year ago, you didn't know I was there, I just kind of, there I am. I'm observing, you don't see me. If I saw you a year ago and I saw you this week, would there be any difference in what you're doing? How about five years ago? How about 10 years ago, which would be really weird because I wasn't even around here yet, you know? Is there any difference in what you're doing with your time alone with the Lord? I never will forget in one of the places where I was, I was introducing the, a, a, the group at Sunday school came to me and said, hey, we want to start a study. You have anything to recommend? And I said, yes, I do. Experiencing God. It's a tremendous study. And I remember recommending it and it got shot down because of one individual in that class who didn't want to break away from open windows. That's all they'd ever know. Open windows or our daily bread, one of those two, you know? And I'm, I'm not, that's a good discipline, folks, at least to be in the Word. But if that's all you're doing, 10 minutes, I hope you're growing an appetite spiritually that is deeper than that. I hope you're growing an appetite that is deeper than just listening to me or whoever's here once a week because I'm not the Holy Spirit. Sure, he uses his time. 
Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Jesus said, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? And just pause right here and say, I get it. I get being tired. I get being worn out. I get being burned out on religion. I do. Come away with me. Jesus says, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And I just want to point out any of these rhythms that we've looked at this morning, whether it's the 30 days to resilience or the prayer circle, or the Beatitudes, none of that is ill-fitting. Even if you're going, good grief, I can't do two devotionals in a day. I can't do a morning and an evening. It's gentle. Do one or the other. Instead of doing 30 days, take 60 days. It's okay, you know? Just get through it. It's good stuff. When Jesus extends this wonderful invitation in Matthew 11, he is inviting us into a relationship not a nap. Although all of us could use a nap every now and then, I think. But he's offering us an unforced rhythm of grace and all the rhythms mentioned thus far fit that description. I want to give you four encouraging guidelines. I hope they're encouraging. As you seek God's rhythm for your life. Four simple things. Number one, slow down. Slow down. The rhythm and pace of our culture is contrary to the rhythm and pace that Jesus calls us to. If we're caught up in the rhythms of this world, whatever they be, business rhythm, play rhythm, there's little place in our day to squeeze Jesus in. It's not supposed to be squeezing him in. He's supposed to be the core. He's supposed to be the center. So slow down. Change your rhythm. You might notice something. You might see a truth from God's word you've never seen before. Like paths instead of paths. But until you slow down or until God slams on your brakes for you, I'd rather he not do that. Because usually when he does, I'm not buckled in. <laughs> you know? uh, he may never see it. Intimacy with Jesus. You know how you spell it? T-I-M-E. The sheep in John 10 hear his voice. Where? From the inside of the fold. And then when they get outside, they hear it too. But they, they start by hearing it inside of the fold. The fold is the holding place. The fold is the be still in no place until he is ready to move us into the next day's journey. Every night, you go into the fold. It's called sleep. You know, it's called rest. From outside the, excuse me, from inside the fold, the sheep wait in expectancy. To hear his voice. I'm not moving until he speaks. They are already leaning in his direction. Not with anxiety. Where'd he go? Where'd he go? No, but with anticipation. Slow down and wait. Slow down and wait upon the Lord. And once he calls you into the right paths, slow down. You heard me quote this a few times here recently, and I got curious enough to go buy the book from Kosuka Koyama. He's the one who came up with the idea of three miles an hour God. And I reread a, a paragraph from him this week. It says, God walks slowly because he is love. If he is not love, he would have gone much faster. Love has its speed. It is an inner speed. It is a spiritual speed. It is a different kind of speed from the technological speed to which we are accustomed. 
It is a slow speed, yet it is Lord over all other speeds since it is the speed of love. It goes on in the depth of our life, whether we notice it or not, whether we are currently hit by a storm or not, at three miles an hour, it is the speed we walk, and therefore it is the speed the love of God walks. Slow down. Second, repeat, repeat. Some rhythms are worth repeating over and over again. Yet I'm afraid some of us, Sometimes, because I've been guilty of this too, we sometimes sprint through our rhythms with our eyes on the horizon looking forward to the next rhythm. Oh, when's the new book gonna, going to come out? You know? Oh, when can I finish 40 days of resilient to get to, let's go 30 days of resilient to get to 40 days of prayer, right? Right? <laughs> when can I read the new whatever, my favorite author book? We're not focused on this, this dance because we're already looking forward to the next one. I'll tell you. I don't like waltzes. I mean, they're boring to me. And if I know, if I ever see a set list and I know I'm in a waltz, get through that, and I see there's a cha-cha coming up, oh, I'm not thinking about the waltz, I'm thinking about the cha-cha. I'm thinking about the mumbo. Can we get to the mumbo? Yes, that's more exciting. How many of us go back and listen to a sermon twice? Especially if we didn't take notes the first time. What did God say last Sunday? Oh, I had a really cool, quiet time with God this week. What did he say to me again? But I was caught up in the spirit. It was really good. He told me something. When I went to visit the General Grant Tree, and I know you're getting tired of me talking about this, but after I spent... An hour and 24 minutes walking that 0.6 mile trail, not even a full, not even a little over a half mile trail. It took an hour and 24 minutes, should have taken me maybe 15. You know what I did? I repeated the experience. I wanted to walk it again. I wanted to see if maybe I had missed something. You're like, how did you miss something? You're going slow. I didn't want to miss a thing. So I went back and then that was Sunday morning. On Friday morning, when I left the park to head to the coast, I stopped at the General Grant Grove again and spent another 30, 40 minutes there. In the summer of 2020, I went through the 40 days of prayer in the praying in the circle, not once, but twice. Now, again, let me just pause right here. That does not make me spiritual. I just felt God leading me to do it. And I had some things in my life that needed to be prayed about in that season. And I was obedient. I did it. This 30 days to resilient, I am in my fifth cycle of listening to this. And it's been an adjustment for me because they are praying on there. And I like the freestyle prayer, you know. But at the same time, I'm like, there's room for me to freestyle prayer in addition. But it is, it, it is drawing out so much. And I highly recommend it. Why did I go back and repeat? Because I didn't get it all the first time. You know, I never learned a new dance in one lesson. I just didn't. You know? right, tell me that again, because I'm not oriented that way. I'm not a dancer. Right? Why did I go back and repeat? Because, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. This is good stuff. I think that might explain why I've eaten at Jyoti Garcia's in Fort Worth at least somewhere between 150 to 200 times. It is a good thing. Good meal. It is worth repeating. So good. It's delicious. So when you come to the end of a rhythm, ask Jesus, all right, what's next? And don't be surprised if he said, let's go back and do this one again. Okay? Slow down. Repeat. Three, be curious. Be curious. Ask God questions. If a verse or passage of scripture intrigues you, dig a little deeper. If you read something that challenges what you thought was true, sometimes that'll happen when you read scripture. Read it for yourself, especially if you're hearing it from up here or any of, any of that other pulpits you could be listening to out there. Read the scripture in more than one translation. Ask God questions and pay attention to the questions that God is asking you. 
I've made a list of such questions this year in my prayer journal. I remember one of the questions that came through Dick Fove, and he just asked the question, what is your dominant spirit? And I had to stop and think about that. What is my dominant spirit? And at the time when he asked the question, I realized my dominant spirit is anxiousness. Even though scripture says, do not be anxious. But I'm there, you know. If you hear a probing question in a sermon, write the question down. Examine it later. Don't just assume a spiritual answer either. Go with your first response without qualifying it. For example, this week. Listening today, or last week, I was listening to day, day 27 of 30 Days to Resilient. The question was raised, are there fears in me around complete surrender? And before I could even process it, it just popped out. Oh, yeah, I, I was kind of surprised at my answers. Fear of missing out, God, that's a fear. And fear of missing something completely wonderful. And then I was like, and fear of missing you? <laughs> but no, your, your, your first answer in the moment. Don't check your answers. Let what's in your heart come out to the surface. Be real. He already knows your spirit. He already knows what's going on. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're a child of God. Be like a child. Children ask 125 questions a day. Adults only ask six. Somewhere along the way, we've lost 119 questions. Ask questions. Slow down, repeat, be curious, and finally, keep your focus on Jesus. Ask Jesus for directions and ask him often. When I was in California, from the first day I reached the first national park where I was, I started seeking the Lord's guidance on my days. I didn't... Sometimes I'll have a plan for vacation and I'll, have, I'll know where I'm going to be every day. But this time I was like, every day I ask, God, what trail do you want me to walk on today? And I waited. I listened to how he responded. And I found myself walking on some trails that I had not planned to walk on. I, they were in the list, but they were somewhere off to the side. I, walked off, I wound up hiking on some trails on different days than I planned to walk. I was often on trails where I did not see another living soul hardly all day. Those were especially fun because I was like, it's just me and the Lord out here on this trail. A few times I thought, you know, I should have called, I should have texted my, one of my kids and at least told them where I am <laughs> so they can come identify dad's body. If I do meet the bear, I'm praying to meet. But I didn't meet the bear, I was praying to meet. He was kind. So we hung out for 30 minutes. It was cool, just me and him. And I would ask God questions like this. What are you trying to teach me, Lord? That, that vacation was monastic. What are you trying to teach me, Lord? What do you want me to hear? What do you want me to see today? And I, I took that kind of diligence in asking questions and I brought it back to regular life. And I asked questions. It's moved to the very top of my weekly list first question who do you want me to share you with today I'm, I'm assuming you have someone for me to share you with who do you want me to set appointments with this week when i have an opportunity to do something i'm like father am i supposed to be here tell me one morning of the first week when I was in California hiking Sequoia, I had a song just come way back to my memory, all the way back to Warner Robins youth ministry days. A song by Al Denson. The song is called, I Choose to Follow. I choose to follow, I choose to let you lead. With childlike faith, I'll walk each day knowing that you're all I need. I choose to love you because you've chosen me of all the things that I could choose to do. Lord, I choose to follow you. I don't want to lose that song. Because that, in a nutshell, is what it means to walk the unforced rhythms of grace. 1 Peter 2.21, to this you were called. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in 
his steps. And then Hebrews 12, 2, let us fix our eyes. Let us glue and fasten our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. And he sat down after he did this, he sat down at the right hand of the father, the right hand of the throne of God, where he sits now to make intercession for us, where he sits now to whisper to our hearts, here's a path for you. I want you to walk this path. The way of the cross, even that is part of the unforced rhythms of grace. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we have a lot of questions that you've raised before us this morning. Help us to spend some time answering those questions to you. May this be a life-changing moment, not only for the rest of the year, but into next year. May we begin to think of these things as we listen for you to call us out of the fold by name and set us on a path that's our path in this season. You're speaking. Help us to say yes. In your name I pray. Stand in 167.